Hey everyone, this is uh, Nitin Sharma, partner and co-founder at Antler India, welcoming you back to the second season of Theory of Next. We started Theory of Next last year in an age where everyone is building in public and we asked ourselves, why not as VCs we think in public and actually flesh out our theses with operators, founders and enthusiasts who are really excited about these spaces shaping our future. So we started last year uh, and in an exciting lineup covering electric vehicles, DAOs, mental health, and even space tech. And we kick off today uh, the second season of Theory of Next with an equally or even more exciting topic. We talk a lot about building in India for the world, and that can mean everything from SaaS to product to platforms in Web3 like Polygon, etc. But one of the most ambitious things to come out of India for the world is the whole idea of digital public goods or digital public infrastructure, DPI as we call it. And everyone here is familiar with UPI and the magic it has created. UPI will do something like $2 trillion in annualized volume soon. It will in two or three years do more transactions than all of Visa's global network combined. And we have seen the impact not just on the lives of consumers but the emergence of many billion dollar companies which have benefited from those rails, from that public infrastructure. And so we tip our hats to the folks who've created this partnership between the public and private sector. And one of the next things they're coming up with after the iteration with UPI and and, uh, things like account aggregator is ONDC, Open Network Digital Commerce. And that's what we will unravel today, layer by layer. So I'm really excited Uh, For this episode, we will start with what DPGs are and why they're important. We will then talk about what makes ONDC a very unique digital public uh, infrastructure example. We will talk about the opportunities that this opens up as well as the challenges. And then we will talk with someone who is at the forefront of making this a reality. And finally, we will leave you with our thoughts on where we think this is headed and what the most interesting opportunities for founders are. Because at the end of the day, that is our reason for existence. So to kick it off, uh, please join me in welcoming my colleague, good friend, and someone who is going very deep into this, um, Sushmit Patodia, who heads capital at Antler India, but also um, has had a very interesting background, you know, as he calls it, the the shift from Kurla to Korbangla, having spent more than a decade in public markets and the Bombay ecosystem to now being here and and helping us, um, you know, peel the various layers of this onion with ONDC. Sushmit, welcome. And uh, you are one of the most passionate believers I know of this uh, this transition, as we call it, from from platform to protocol. So why don't you start with with what got you interested? Hi, Nitin, and uh, uh, hello to everyone who's uh, tuning in to watch us. Thank you for uh, having me at Antler. It's been a phenomenal eleven months here. Uh, we've already seen uh, sometimes I feel two cycles in eleven months. What may take eleven years for a lot of people. Uh, Coming to what got me interested, uh, I think uh, it is the whole evolution that we've seen, uh, which is going from uh, what we call pipeline to platform to now protocol, right? Uh, As uh, economies mature and as technologies uh, evolve, you have this movement. Uh, 70 years ago, 80 years ago, you could only buy a Ford car in Detroit in the color black, right? Uh, From there, we moved on to platforms, uh, which are famously known as the Amazons or the Flipkarts of the world where they aggregated sellers from everywhere and uh, that helped uh, and reached buyers uh, at anywhere in the world, which unlocked the second leg of commerce in the world. And I think uh, the next 10 years is going to be about protocols. uh, And uh, that's what really got me excited that is this the next 10 year journey that we are all embarked. So I think the so that I think that whole pipeline to platform to protocol like that's a really really interesting idea and I want you to go a little bit deeper into that because a lot of people here have heard of open source protocols web3 jargon is all about protocols um, what does it mean right what does it mean for us to say that we have to think about this world in terms of a protocol it's interesting uh you know, what, what does a protocol do? And if I may take the example uh, of a very simple thing like an email, uh, you know, you can send uh, any email from, uh, you may have a Gmail account and you can send it to someone who has a Hotmail account. That is the power of the protocol, right? Uh, which is, it makes it interoperable. You know, you are not captive uh, to the uh, provider of the service, but it allows you to inter, uh, to be interoperable across uh 
multiple service providers in the same technology. And that's the power of uh, protocol. Uh, so it makes it interoperable. Uh, to give you a more uh, a hard life example or an example that we all can relate to is, uh, you know, you may have an account in uh, Kotak Bank and uh, you hence have a Kotak Bank ATM card, but you can use that ATM card in an SBI ATM and draw money from that ATM. So ATM uh, is a protocol. Yeah, ATM is is the resultant of uh, a, an interoperable uh, protocol which sits behind that. Right. So everything on the internet, TCP, IP, SMTP, HTTP protocols, ATMs are an example of protocol. But we don't think of commerce as, as protocols, right? And maybe that's what you're implying is the big idea here. Um, so, so a lot of people will probably, you know, take the view that, uh, okay, UPI happened because of a few specific reasons, but that was in payments. Uh, and we are now talking about sort of protocols in commerce. Um, and, a lot, and it's not clear, right, on the surface that commerce can be turned into protocols. Uh, what does that exactly mean? So the, uh, you know, when you have to make anything into a protocol, you have to break it down into the first principles that enable uh, that becoming a protocol, right? So for example, if you take UPI, which you referred to, uh, UPI was broken down into bank account, uh, phone number, and then making the transaction, right? And you, when you break that down, you're able to make it interoperable. In commerce, very simply put, what, do you, what are the players involved? Uh, you have buyers, sellers, and someone who comes and delivers or fulfills the order for you. And uh, the last part is if there is a problem or if there's a governance problem and across these three spectrums, uh, somebody to help you with that. So if there's a protocol which allows you to move across these four or tie all these four together without being uh, in a single stack, uh, it would result in a protocol. Got it. So, so what does, uh, so I think kind of moving to the differences between a protocol like UPI and what happened in payments to commerce. Like what do you think makes the idea of ONDC more interesting or more unique, complex? Uh, so, you know, there is a, uh, you know, while the uh, the narrative that we have heard uh, for a long time is uh, ONDC is like UPI, uh, while it is true, it is also wrong. It is also false at some, uh, at, at multiple uh, layers. Uh, it is true because it is interoperable. And that is a core part of or, or a core principle of digital public infrastructure. But there are a huge number of differences when it comes to thinking uh, about ONDC from a UPI lens. Uh, the first big difference is scale, right? Uh, the scale of UPI and ONDC are very different. Uh, we call this the problem of aggregating uh, a small number of large players versus a large number of small players. UPI uh, Actually, was sitting. Really, really uh, let's let's pause on that's a really important idea. So, UPI was about a small number of large players talking to each other and playing nice with each other, and ONDC will be about a large number of small players. Okay, interesting. Absolutely. Uh, you know, just to give put some numbers to this, UPI was about fifty banks, right? If fifty banks came on board and uh, on the UPI protocol, then you pretty much covered ninety five percent of. India's population. India has 63 million enterprises. So it is about at some level digitizing them and aggregating them and bringing them to a, a standard protocol, which is mammoth exercise, as you can imagine, 63 million versus 50. So one point you mentioned is, is scale, but what else? What else makes it more interesting or complex? This, the, the other big difference between UPI and ONDC is the dealing with the physical world or what we call the atoms world. While UPI just dealt with the bits world or just was a technology there, right? Uh, payments was already digitized thanks to RTGS, NEFT. So there was a digital layer on top of the payments already. Uh, UPI took this digital layer and made it interoperable. Uh, and there was no involvement of what we call the physical world or the atoms. In commerce, there is involvement of the physical world, which makes it more complex because you may get an order online or electronically, uh, but you have to deliver the goods in the physical world. Whenever there is interaction between these two worlds, there is friction, right? And that's what makes it more complex. So, okay. so you brought up some important points around large number of small players versus small number of large players, the physical, digital, atoms, bits, and uh, and also it's a big 
shift in thinking it's a it's a big it's a it's a novel behavior right that's sort of probably the other big question mark no absolutely uh, india is the first country to do this in the world that has its own uh, what we call imagination challenges right it is no more building x of for india or y for india uh, you are actually building something unique in india and it's it's interesting you, you, a lot of the uh, conversations that we all have been having with with folks in the iceberg back in ondc ecosystems right the india is the only country in the world where this experiment of digital public infrastructure is being tried at a population scale and of course uh, now it's becoming an export to to many other interesting markets not just the developing world but even uh, developed markets um so scale complexity novelty interesting challenges now if it is so hard and i'm sure there are many more challenges that we haven't even talked about uh, i guess our job is is to dream and and to optimistically look at what could be the big big change great so let me first start with uh, the two most common uh, misconceptions about ondc or uh, the wrong ways to think about ondc right the first is ondc is not a website it's not a platform it is just a set of protocols which allows you to do commerce interoperably and it does not keep you hostage to one player right so i think that is the first thing it is not a website it is not a a platform it's a protocol uh, the second is uh, as soon as we start thinking about a new revolution as something that is going to kill x or kill y or it's going to be disruptive uh, you start to pigeon hole your imagination uh, so you know we would love to we would love for people to think away from these two ways to think and move to what we call it is the way that commerce is going to get more expansive right by having more sellers on board by including more sellers on board is going to make commerce more expansive in india digital payment is 30% to 35% already commerce is still at 9% right uh, so one of the biggest roles of ondc will be how do i take this 9 to 30 over the next 10 15 years right and i think that's a big point that uh, you know disruption at as such is probably a uh, uh, it's a luxury for a kind of term to use in in advanced markets in in places like india it's not about disruption it's about expansion first and it's about the inclusive and expansive way to grow the market rather than worry about uh, necessarily you know killing x or y as you said um, so that's a very very important idea so in what ways uh, are we talking about that expansion is i mean one thing we already mentioned is 95% of the sellers who are not online uh could come online so tell us about what about ondc makes that easy today if you want to be an e-commerce company you have to develop a way to get customers uh you need to figure out where i'm going to get the product from you need to then sell to the customer and then make sure that the product or service is delivered to the customer this is a herculean effort for any person starting off on e-commerce what ondc is trying to do is break this whole thing down into independent units of commerce and economics right so now you could just decide that i am only going to build great products but i am not going to go and look for customers i am going to give that to someone else to do it and now that will be possible absolutely right right you ondc allows you or any for that matter interoperable commerce allows you to be a specialist in one of these four things because if you are able to specialize in one there will be someone else who will specialize in the other there will be somebody else who will specialize in the third and the fourth and when you come together you create an experience which a full stack player cannot deliver well i think uh, some might argue that so let as you call those those roughly those four pieces right now that a plus b plus c plus d is being handled by a few centralized platforms and they have learned over time that tight control of the user experience is helpful but what you're saying is that is because you didn't have something like ondc if you had if you can actually unbundle if you can actually think of these as legos and you know the whole thing as a composable set of protocols apis uh, all these building blocks then you can specialize in one of these and the customer experience in the end can still be just as good as it is with a large platform that does all of this today and uh, perhaps even better so the specialization leads to standards uh, or the standards lead to specialization 
and at the end of the day it's more value for sellers and buyers is is how i'm understanding this like what kind of things will people specialize in i have my son's birthday coming up in a in a month and the thing that i've always struggled with is cakes cake is very very difficult to get delivered to your party or to your house uh, using two wheeler and the same delivery person who uh, gives you a cup of noodles but hence cake is not a very penetrated e-commerce category now imagine i can build a specialized delivery channel for cake delivery and that will unlock the cake market for e-commerce right so you know instead of coming it from the customer angle you start to think of it from the uh, angle of the uh, you know what i can do in supply and fulfillment which can actually unlock the commerce from the other end right uh, that's one way to think about it uh, you know to give you a more relatable example uber uh, the the cost for hailing a taxi was zero for a customer the cost for uh, the taxi guy to get a passenger was zero right so why did uber exist uber existed because they brought supply which was non existent or which was dormant and then created customer demand for that supply so i think if 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 i have to recap what we've discussed so far around why this could be so big one is the the very onboarding of small businesses onto or to anything online could be sped up to the examples you are giving seem to suggest that at the very least in all these uh, small towns and hyper local economies where all of this local buying and selling is completely offline right now maybe that's where you know you could just uh, actually enable a lot of digital commerce to happen right and because you i'm picking up on your uber example uh, if you think of the world in micro markets and local economies much more uh, you could see a lot more uh, digital activity and then we talked about how at a higher level people could specialize in one of those uh, parts of the value chain and i think the other thing that comes to mind is data right for me i have found that to be very interesting today you have brands and buyers and sellers and they really don't know each other the seller doesn't know uh any doesn't really have much data on who's buying brands don't know any of this and arguably that could also change a lot with something like wendy absolutely in fact uh, you know this is where the whole concept of a uh, governance and infrastructure comes in uh, and maybe we can uh, peel that onion uh, what is that for, mean? yeah so in any commerce transaction uh, you know if you were to take a step back and uh, you know think of it from not the buyer seller delivery but from a governance and infrastructure perspective which is that you know there is an infrastructure layer to the commerce and there's a governance layer to the commerce let's talk about the infrastructure layer first which is what we already discussed there's a buyer there's a seller there's a fulfillment channel and there's a payment uh, channel the governance angle is the trust aspect of a commerce transaction the reason that you go or you know let's take the example of upi you were comfortable using upi because you trusted in that upi mechanism right uh, but the easy thing with payments is the trust is established or delivered within 10 seconds right so you make a payment to somebody and that other person in 10 or 15 or 20 seconds knows that they have got the payment right so it's easy to establish trust while in commerce the trust aspect may get delivered in one day two days or maybe a week right so whom how do i ensure that this transaction goes through and this is where uh, you know players like amazon have done a fantastic job right they actually have delivered on the governance angle time and time again but there's a cost to it the cost is what you rightly said the buyer doesn't know who the seller is and so on and so forth right uh, what we call business intelligence is not democratized it is capitalized and when you have a protocol which also takes care of governance you can actually democratize business intelligence i don't know if uh, i made sense to you but no uh, i i think you know, what you're saying is to say that all the data should be exchanged right as a buyer i should as a seller i should be able to get all that data and currently you don't see that with the large marketplaces and of course there is no incentive for them to do that uh, but to say that it will get democratized without something like ondc is very hard exactly exactly i guess what you're saying is if there are these standards and there is trust in the system and you can also build other levels of uh, privacy controls and um, you know in, in ensuring that data is is uh, flowing across these levels within the right parameters and it's even monetized uh, in the right way without compromising anything about the consumer then um, 
perhaps it becomes a very different economy, right? Where sellers know who's buying, the brands know something who's buying. At least at a at a high level, they have uh, you know parametric data about these things. So th- that's fascinating in a way if you think about what that could unlock. Um, in fact, other- uh, Nitin, just to build on that, right? I mean, there is this whole another uh, aspect of commerce that we have not even thought about, which is financialization, right? Today, uh, it is so difficult for a seller to be able to go to a bank and get a working capital loan uh, based on the cash flow that they generate because that cash flow is captive to a few platforms or a few uh, centralized networks. But on ONDC, you can actually have a bank sit on top of this whole thing and say, okay, this seller, uh, maybe a small town, uh, great handicraft producer in uh, Assam, but I, on ONDC, I can see the entire uh, flow of commerce and actually I can go and then fund working capital for that entrepreneur, which is not possible today. That's a, that's a huge point. I mean, we've seen so many companies uh, talking about fintech and finance for small businesses and it's, it's all great, but it's a lot of incremental change to, to lower the cost of capital, etc. But if you think about the whole system differently, uh, every business could be in control of their history of selling to consumers and and you know you could underwrite that in a very robust way uh, what else could happen let's let's uh, think of other possibilities so I suppose uh, one other thing you've, you've mentioned is uh, complex commerce or or sort of more complex use cases so give, give us some examples of that we spoke about uh, the cake delivery right uh, one of the big the other huge segment of commerce in India which is not yet digitized is uh, what we call bulk items or you know something like a furniture uh, furniture uh, the big problem with furniture is fulfillment in india right uh, we all have had furniture delivered to our house uh, sometimes it doesn't even enter the lift door right and sometimes it doesn't even enter our main door uh, sometimes you need the legs cut a little bit and so on and so forth uh, now today the challenge is that somebody has to ensure that there are buyers on my platform to somebody has to ensure that i have these uh, furniture pieces in my go down then then somebody has to ensure and the same person is doing all this and it's a huge task now if i break this down right and i say okay i am a furniture delivery expert in bangalore right uh, anybody who's selling furniture i will take care of your fulfillment that unlocks you know uh, i think uh, if i may use the example of ikea i think ikea has done this fantastically in india uh, to me that is the first application of uh, interoperable commerce which is that ikea sells you furniture but urban company comes and fixes the ikea furniture for you right ikea realized very early in india that india is not a do it yourself market right uh, we are too spoiled to do it yourself uh, so you need someone to fix it for you and you will not trust your local carpenter to fix IKEA. So what did IKEA do? IKEA ran training programs and got urban company uh, to supply them skilled labor. And they are now official uh, assemblers of uh, IKEA furniture. Again, not, never been tried in the world. Like you will never find a carpenter for IKEA in anywhere in the world, right? But it's in India. Uh, so I think that's a beautiful example of how a complex commerce it has already been broken down into specialized fulfilling uh, agents because of which you're able to uh, expand the market. And you could, it's, uh, you could expand this further to multimodal, as, as I think you were mentioning, multimodal commerce, um, even things with cross-border commerce, right? Uh, so what are some of those examples? Uh, so Nitin, this is, uh, you know, if, if uh, ONDC uh, is already... I would say a sort of a pie in the sky. I think cross border on ONDC is, uh, you know, uh, trying to build space tech cities uh, uh, already. But since we have done that once, we're going to try and do this again. Uh, now, imagine if the same protocol exists in uh, in Europe or in Germany, right? And uh, you can actually then start interacting cross border using the same protocols obviously compliant to your uh, laws laws of the land but you don't need to now log into another platform in another language go and register yourself etc etc 
the two protocols start talking to each other. Yeah. So I think we were joking about examples like uh, I think in the, uh, the the furniture case that technically it could mean that you could buy furniture from anywhere uh, yeah. online and, and that uh, furniture seller will just rely on their partners in India to do the rest and uh, that opens up a market or I think the multimodal thing was interesting. Uh, I, I think we were discussing cases like if you can just have a buyer app where you know that the minute you land at an airport, you need X or Y. That can't happen today unless you go yeah. across apps. But maybe you could imagine a future where um, it would be very multimodal. So there is a certain type of service or good you need when you land and then something you need when you get home and it could all happen automatically. I think automation is really the key. Uh, you know, you know, so it's a very interesting point that you make uh, on this whole uh, multimodal. And I think, you know, if you were to, uh, you know, think about this a little differently, which is that when you disaggregate or make it uh, multimodal or, you know, anybody can talk to each other. So disaggregate and interoperable, you actually give back the choice to the user right, or to the customer. So I think that is how, uh, from a customer's angle, so we've been talking more from a supply and fulfillment angle, but from a customer side angle, uh, the choice is yours, right? You can choose when do you want the delivery, how 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 you want the delivery, how expensive, what time, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, right? Because those things are now available in modules for you to choose. So you're saying that uh, uh, across the spectrum of income levels, spending levels, you could create, uh, you could imagine commerce could be very different for someone in a rural area who's happy to wait for something, uh, but just wants 15, 20% lower price because they're more price sensitive, all the way to someone who's a big spender and just wants more customization, personalization could all happen more easily. So, so let's recap. If this thing was to take off, which is super exciting, right? One, 95% plus of sellers who are not online could come online faster the local economies at the very least the hyper local buying and selling from local businesses uh, could could get very interesting and digital which is not the case today uh, data would flow across buyers sellers brands in a way we don't have yet and that would give sellers much more control brands more visibility it could also financialize it much more and have underwriting of that happen in a way that's more powerful for the seller it could mean specialization where, as you said, buyer, seller, logistics and payments, you could have anyone take the view that we should focus on solving one part of it rather than trying to do everything. It could mean better solutions for more complex commerce cases, multimodal, uh, cross-border and all kinds of possibilities. So it is phenom- It is fascinating when you think about it. Um, and, and I think... The part that's also interesting, if I'm thinking about it like a founder, is you can really imagine a massive size of this in India, but it also perhaps gives you some foundation to think globally pretty early. Because technically, if if ONDC is taken to other countries, you can also start creating software in India, work on those standards from here without the constraints of the local market. Right? So it's also a global opportunity. Um, All that being said, I think we have to sober it with some reality as well, right? So I want to get your quick thoughts on um, beyond things we discussed in the beginning. It's a new behavior. The scale is very different. It's very complex atoms and bits. Um, It's also probably fundamentally still not solving the problem of CAC, right? On the demand side, uh, one could argue that the e-commerce players and anyone selling online is really... The first, the biggest struggle they have is it's expensive to acquire customers. So that may or may not get solved with ONDC, right? Or do you think there's something there? You know, whenever I think of CAC or any such metric, I have two ways to, I've always thought about it in two different aspects, right? One is CAC is always relative to the income level of the customer, right? Because that translates to lifetime value of the customer and that in a way decides what your CAC should be. And that again is a point in time data point, right? Uh, are we saying 10 years down the line, uh, the lifetime value of an Indian customer will not be higher than today? It will be. So can the CAC be uh, actually much better off uh, as a variable to play off? It will be. Right? So whenever we talk about point-in-time metric, or, or always... Lifetime value, because 
even if the CAC yes. is high, if these consumers are just buying more often and for a longer duration, you will still have a good payback. Exactly. Right. Uh, number one. And second is, uh, one of the things that you've always uh, spoken about is CAC is about awareness and conversion. Right. Mm. Uh, I agree that ONDC may not, I mean, at least we do not yet imagine ways in which it incre- increase awareness, but it can surely, surely increase conversion for sure. Right. Uh, if I push you with better product range, with faster delivery, with better delivery, uh, how can conversion not go up? It will go up, right? Uh, so if you break down CAC in these two aspects, I think one uh, LTV of any Indian customer will go up. Otherwise, we all will not be doing what we're doing today. And second is uh, CAC is awareness and conversion and conversion will go up. Because there are better services, right? Right. And I think uh, the important thing with this, and you know, we went through this uh, five or six years ago with Web3. And you yeah. started the conversation with this. You have to change your mindset or your frame of reference. Uh, if you think about it as a protocol, some of the answers don't exist today. Yeah. But the hypothesis do. So your awareness conversion could go up. If 95% of sellers are not selling offline, uh, online, and many of them start selling online, that also builds awareness at a different level. And if, uh, if, if prices are going down or if the experience is actually smooth, maybe the average conversion rate, you know, today we say two or 3% conversion is great. If you can imagine a world where that becomes five or 6%, then you have different math. So uh, lots of unanswered questions, CAC being one big one. I think the other thing we've obviously heard from some of the practitioners in the space is, um, Currently, the, the framework is not very clear about how grievances will be redressed or how various players can actually be incentivized to exchange information, right? Because uh, the current framework is not very clear that they have to, uh, any marketplace has to make it equal for all sellers, right? They may have their own captive sellers and they may still continue to pr- promote them. So that then doesn't really democratize anything. Um, and I think we will continue to have many of these challenges for many years, including the complexity that you mentioned. But all that being said, exciting, very exciting. So maybe the next thing is what is happening, right? So let's let's try and understand, Sushmit, uh, who's doing what right now? What is the landscape looking like? Uh, sure. So, uh, you know, to give uh, due credit to NDC uh, as the organization, uh, they have done a fantastic job in actually democratizing information on who's building what in what space. So. You know, if you just look at this, uh, what we call the ONDC landscape uh, that we have put together for you, there are effectively five key players in the landscape, right? You have the buyer apps, we have the seller apps, uh, we have the technology service providers, we have logistics or fulfillment partners, and we have the last, what is called the online dispute resolution providers. If you go back to the governance and infrastructure uh, discussion we had, the first four are a part of the infrastructure layer and the last is the governance layer. So buyer app, Very simple, as you can see the examples. Uh, Today, most of uh, the buyer discovery happens on uh, websites like uh, Amazon, Flipkart, Meshows of the World. But uh, now the buyer can actually search for uh, anything on Google also, right? If Google becomes a buyer app, you can search for Tandoori Chicken for Lunch on Google and that will show you options available. Paytm, for example, is uh, live on ONDC and championing this cause. And if you go to the Paytm app, you can actually see a small widget called ONDC, where if you click, you have options of grocery, restaurants, etc. Then comes the seller app. Seller app are the ones uh, which enable the sellers to go on ONDC. Again, very simple example could be Pet Puja, right? Uh, I'm sure it's up there. Pet Puja is one of the largest uh, restaurant uh, POS uh, companies. And uh, Pet Puja can enable all its restaurants to go on ONDC and actually take the order. The third is technology service providers, which are people who will enable all these uh, uh, sellers to go digital and to go online. And uh, there we have Zoho, who is doing a phenomenal job here, uh, trying to help uh, uh, businesses uh, go digital and uh, get on ONDC. Uh, Logistics, very simple, something that we all can relate to, a delivery, a Dunzo, uh, a load share, which basically will take the uh, order uh, from the seller and deliver it to the buyer. You may feel that, oh, do I have to go to a buyer app and then go to the seller app and then go to the logistics provider? No, you don't have to. Uh, 
uh, the protocol enables all this to talk with each other seamlessly and with very, very little latency so that you may not even feel that you are actually uh, on different, different uh, service providers. Uh, the other thing that gets enabled uh, with this is the choices with you. You can choose uh, which restaurant you want your chicken from. Uh, you can choose how fast you want it. And you can also choose which delivery person is going to deliver it for you. The last is the online dispute resolution providers. This is, I would say, the uh, the youngest uh, uh, piece of ONDC and it's still evolving. But uh, whatever we have discussed and learned uh, with ONDC is that this could actually, the way they're thinking about rankings and ratings could actually be another revolution that we haven't talked about. And uh, frankly, uh, today may not be the right day to talk about it, but you know, using a mix of uh, algorithms and blockchain where uh, uh, your dispute resolution feeds into your ratings uh, could actually start the flywheel of uh, better fulfillment and better ratings. That's uh, that's quite a spread. So do we have a view for which ones are more interesting right now for founders who are listening or for people who are really tinkering with where this goes? Do you have a thesis for the two or three things that might be the most interesting? Uh, sure. Uh, I mean, one is uh, pretty obvious that we've already kind of spoken about at length uh, is uh, fulfillment, right? You could have different ways to go at fulfillment. Uh, you know, again, you know, whenever you order, uh, uh, let's say a laptop, the delivery experience is the same as you order a 10 rupee battery. Why should that be the case? I can make a case that I will be the fulfillment channel for expensive electrical and electronic items. As I said, furniture, right? So that is one opportunity, which is, can you specialize in fulfillment? Uh, the second is uh, seller apps. There are so many, so many, you know, 96% as Nitin said of Indian uh, sellers are not digitized. Uh, helping them go digital is, is another way, uh, is another huge opportunity. Uh, the third big opportunity is... Uh, creating logic or uh, languages to use the data that will get available. Uh, for example, uh, HUL, for example, uh, doesn't know who is the buyer of that Dove shampoo, but they would love to sell a conditioner to that customer, but they can't do it today. But with ONDC, that data may be available to them. And hence, can you build on top of that? Interesting. And, and maybe also things like... Uh inventory management and uh, uh, dynamic pricing perhaps like you know or is that too far-fetched you think that uh, uh, sellers will be able to dynamically price right right now they don't have that control no Nathan, it is not at all far-fetched in fact uh, you know things concepts like dynamic pricing have never entered our uh, commerce world right uh, they've always i mean and but the, the the great thing is they exist right you know it is airlines right uh, uh, you know that for example, some of the restaurants uh, in the world, the most famous restaurants, uh, have dynamic pricing, right? If you book two weeks in advance, you get it at a lower rate. And if you book a week in advance, you get it at a higher rate. But those things have never been uh, a part of our uh, commerce. And it's not, and everything has a time and place, right? So I think uh, ONDC enables you this, right? Which is that I have five uh, pieces uh, of uh, laptop left and the new model is coming in. Instead of putting a big discount, uh, you know, spend, I can actually ping uh, anybody uh, who has bought a laptop two years ago that, you know, this laptop is available at a 20% discount. Do you want it? Yeah. That's dynamic pricing. Very cool. And so let's start to wrap it up with a couple of big key questions, right? Um, for founders specifically. One is, how do you think this uh, adoption is going to play out? Uh, what do we know right now with, with the roadmaps? In the next, let's say, one or two years, uh, how do you think this will start becoming mainstream? Uh, so one of our thesis is that this will be slower than uh, uh, UPI uh, because as we discussed, there is involvement of the physical world or the atoms world. There is friction, uh, which means there involvement no will be lower. Yeah, <laughs> yeah uh, well, hopefully not think, uh, something. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't think we'll have a decommercialization event uh, for ONDC to do well. Uh, and uh, as I said, right, uh, we have to think of this as expansive. Uh, that is a very, very important lens to wear rather than disruptive. So the way we think this will evolve is uh, there will be hyper local pools of capital, pools of liquidity that will get created, right? And it is better to think of this as 
a string of pearls that will get created rather than uh, one huge seamless rail that will get created right okay. so okay. so somebody may uh, build uh, uh, liquidity for discovering uh, handicrafts in a certain state and they would earn the right to then have that piece and so on and so forth yeah and what kind of founders are a good fit to to build with this uh, yeah so this is uh, uh, again something that uh, you know people call vcs to be presumptuous but uh, let me take a stab at it uh, the first and the most important thing is that this involves the physical world so this is not something that you can sit uh, in your offices uh, this involves a little bit of being on the ground understanding how the commerce happens currently from first principles and then trying to think about how can we expand this so uh, there is a little bit of uh, dust and grime involved in building in you know, ondc uh, then just a uh, nice air conditioning uh, uh, software uh, startups right number one number two uh, this is revenue from day one and i think this is again something that uh, is n- is not a narrative that why we, we kind of that? lost why do you say that because because nitin this is commerce right uh, in commerce everybody makes money or you will not be in commerce right uh, okay. this is not the language of commerce payment is the language of commerce right this is commerce really uh, so if you're helping someone uh, to discover uh, a piece of meat you can actually get money from the seller if you're he- helping someone to deliver something you can actually make money if you're helping that seller to unlock another channel of commerce for them which is digital you you can actually make money from you're right so the transaction and so each person can each party can actually make a margin because it is all transaction revenue yeah exactly it's it's already revenue so there could right? also be ad revenue coming into the ecosystem which doesn't come in today so that that's another possibility but uh, i see your point that each part is revenue so so are you saying so one is they have to be on the ground uh and and take more bottom up first principles i think a part of that is a lot of init- in initial entrants are actually taking a services view so they're building like service offerings and uh and not necessarily what we think of products in a vc sense and that's okay sometimes because you have to do things that don't scale uh initially the second you said that uh, uh it's it's sort of you will make money but but tell me more about the the founder archetypes i think the the other uh, aspect is that uh, you have to think about trying to get one small sliver of this whole thing correct first right uh, you can have a big big hairy audacious goal if you're going to work on ondc it has to start small right it cannot start i'm going to rule uh, everything about this in india right it has to sp- start small and that is very very important right you need to have that niche uh it, and it can be a niche which could, which could be any uh, orthogonal angle right for example uh you can be that technology service provider on ondc which will help uh, d2c first time d2c brands come on ondc faster right it could be as small sliver as that uh and uh, or it could be i'm going to master furniture delivery in indranagar right it could be as small as that so you have to start uh, small uh because if you master it you will build this out over multiple geographies or multiple verticals uh and that is huge outcome got it and and i think it goes without saying that you have to be very nimble and patient because uh, as it is with anything in a, in a new protocol world right the founders in 19 the 90s uh, if you were too impatient about creating large businesses before the eyeballs were the only metric right um you probably didn't make it but if you survived it with the dot com bust you had large companies get created on the same thing is playing out right now in my opinion in web3 where multiple cycles of disappointment but still the promise remains and so if you're doing this you have to evolve as that protocol and ecosystem is evolving so it's it's really for founders who can be very nimble and also patient um fascinating stuff um, sushmit so would you say that if you had if if we th- if we thought of our concluding thoughts around this <clears throat> um is it is it a different way to think about how large these venture outcomes will be uh yeah uh, so nitin i think uh, you know just on your patient point i think you make a fantastic point there which is that uh, the founders here can afford to be patient because you make revenue from day one right mm-hmm. so it's it's a, it's kind of a uh, coming together of these two aspects 
and uh, what will it mean for outcomes and you know uh, even for vc firms i think uh, today uh, we have a very very lopsided outcome matrix in uh, e-commerce right you either have decacons or multi decacons or you have nothing uh, if you were to think about this uh, you could actually have maybe 100 unicorns uh, in indian commerce uh because you could specialize you could focus on one thing and just build in that and not worry about building the entire stack right and eventually in 10 years that segment will become big enough so this is our my hypothesis that you could actually have a 100 unicorns come out of uh uh building in ondc uh rather than uh, a five uh decacons yeah okay interesting so while everyone likes that uh 500 billion 100 billion trillion whatever uh large platform outcome uh, there are many many more ways to create value here and uh, and and like we discussed not just with india in mind although that's the main opportunity uh but it's really the you can have your cake and eat it too you can think global and build in india and uh 100 unicorns is a, is a great way to sort of end this conversation thank you sushmit and now we will actually uh why don't we also uh shift gears and involve someone who's been at the forefront so we are going to also loop in uh, sujit nair who is the ceo at the beckin foundation and beckin is le- taking leading the charge on evangelizing this protocol taking it to various stakeholders in india and across the world and so he's really at the forefront of what is happening day to day how this protocol is getting designed uh, how initial adoption is happening and we will hear a lot more from him So over to you Sujit. Thank you Nathan. Wonderful to be here. Uh, thank you for having me. Hey Sushmit, good to see you as well. Uh yeah, I think this has been one crazy story that that we sort of taken off. Uh, uh I think the the conversation acts on the concept of interoperability dates back to Aadhaar itself. I had the opportunity as a management consultant to work with Aadhaar in the Aadhaar program in the early 2010 and as part of the early team putting together the whole program some pieces of the program together and ever since uh, i think that template of population scale digital transformation through very limited lightweight digital infrastructure as kind of stuck on as as a core the- theme or a thesis in whatever work that i was doing ever since um of course uh, since aadhaar i've been working on mobility and payments quite a bit and it's that journey in urban mobility transportation space that that brought me again on a table with conversation with nandaran pramod to to think of finding uh, a dpi or a digital public infrastructure equivalent of solving for mobility at a population scale and we thought uh, even everybody is building you know new forms of mobility new platforms to bring them all together but why not we sort of create uh a, a spec based digital public infrastructure uh, protocol and and work on that so it was mobility sort of was the the reason and inspiration for why we started off what we did uh we used to call ourselves open shared mobility foundation uh those is and this was now about 2018 uh but very quickly we realized that whatever we were building as a bunch of specifications called the beckin protocol what is sort of relevant for sectors beyond mobility i mean logistic was a clearly an adjacent case that we could solve with with backend but we realized that it can be it can be made applicable for a whole lot of things and that's how commerce healthcare and a whole lot of things have been shaping up um, so that's largely the the story behind how backend as an idea got started uh it's an interesting uh, sort of a, a time when of course con- the whole world was reeling through the pandemic and i was fortunate enough to be part of this early conceptualization think tank uh, on ondc uh, right at the beginning of the pandemic when we said you know if we the world has to go through this again is there a as a longer sustainable solution to make small businesses find a way to do business and and sustain themselves in the digital economy and we thought that you know this this backend or a backend way of thinking could be the answer and that led to many other conversation and discussions and i think today we have a formal sort of an initiative a program called ondc happening in a big way you know one uh, very common place misunderstanding that i come across is people ask me where is the ondc website right <laughs> so ondc is also uh, not a website uh, which uh, you know it's a protocol uh, which is based on backend and uh, sujit would love for you to you know give us a, maybe an overview of you know what this protocol is why is this as a protocol 
and uh, you know how should we think about this you're right i mean the fact that ondc as it as the name suggests when expanded to open network for digital commerce that it's not one platform but it's a network it's an ecosystem of many platforms trying to come together and today anybody can build a platform and be part of this network and bring uh, its side of users whether it's consumers or providers online uh, i think the whole idea therefore is that ondc is sort of the the glue that is connecting different platforms and systems coming together and you know creating an opportunity for a much wider access whether it's on supply and demand and make that happen and that's where that 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 essential glue that connects them all is the protocol is this common set of specifications a common set of a, a vocabulary uh, which is not a one particular platform's proprietary vocabulary but a vocabulary everybody understands because typically everything is something that you search for something you find it sort of add it to the cart place an order you track it that that essential vocabulary should be common across all participating you know parties so the buyers and sellers who may not be on the same platform but on different platforms at any point of time and start interacting with each other and that idea uh, is the essence of the beckon protocol and when you adapt that for a country like india at a scale uh, and then bring all the platforms operating in the country together you essentially have the ondc network and the fact that it is supported uh by the policy uh makers especially government of india dpiit and 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 it has its own institutional banking backing in the form of a, of a section 8 not for profit um, uh institution like ondc limited to give it an institutional backing so that the whole development and sustainable agenda is possible and make more people aware especially the the small businesses and the larger community there i think that's what ondc is trying to solve for and it's fascinating how it has come this far obviously there are many challenges ahead but uh, but those are things that we need to solve because nobody has done this before or thought of this before and it's very counterintuitive even today to think of commerce being a multi platform decentralized literally broken down across multiple parts to all come together and deliver at scale so yeah that's that's what ondc is trying to do connecting the dots here a little bit um, so you helped us trace how this got started and how it's thought of as this very interoperable set of uh you know apis and and connecting infrastructure um but i think it would really help to understand with an example because someone and you know we spend a lot of time also for example on the web3 side of things so we believe in decentralization but of course it's a work in progress and people are always skeptical if you take some central party out how, the, do the behaviors actually work do the incentives actually work so i'd be curious if you have any example um that you could walk us through sure um yeah i think i can take the example of namay yatri which is a open mobility network initiative similar to ontc that's happening in bangalore uh, especially with auto rickshaw drivers so uh, this was a conversation that we picked up last year somewhere around may june wherein we have uh, we had a bunch of auto rickshaw drivers representing a certain union come together and say is there a way we can participate in this whole digital rail hailing by ourselves where we sort of have some bit of a control and agency you know uh, to to sort of have our own policies pricing booking etc and uh, that's when we started this conversation and we could get, bring a tech partner for them in the form of jaspay and this was completely a community initiative from the beckon so we had some mobility volunteers from the beckon open collective to sort of spearhead this conversation and that conversation led to creation of what is called as a namaya 3 platform where the drivers from the union have on their own terms could come and register define their own pricing even some of the product features and the and the consumer flows that they want to enable which they with oh. their under, deep understanding of the users and you know, keeping in mind uh, the empathy and you know the users uh, natural selection of choices and things like that so they designed this product and somewhere around november they launched this product now the idea is to make a uh, any customer tomorrow discover an auto rickshaw in bangalore uh, from any app of their choice okay so we are looking at some of the other apps also like on the consumer side a consumer could be on let's say google map or any of the upi apps and still discover the driver who happens to be in a namaya 3 platform or another pla- which is another platform altogether uh, i think that was the vision today in this last 3 months what we have done is we they, they have created a dummy consumer app with a customer with with literally no marketing it already has some 2 lakh odd uh, downloads and customers are proactively reaching out to drivers through this app using the beckon protocol which is connecting the two platforms and placing ride orders and actually hailing auto rickshaws uh, this is a great story for the fact that this is something that was created 
created created by the auto rickshaw drivers for themselves they have their own policies about who gets the rides how is the allocation done and consumers are also sort of very excited for the fact that there's no central middleman or an intermediary that they're talking to they're directly talking to the driver and interacting and it's kind of like a peer to peer mobility transfer, uh, transaction that is happening and it's fascinating to see within two months with literally no spends on customer acquisition or marketing uh, they're able to generate close to 4000 rides a day in the in city of bangalore and you have over 30000 auto rickshaws already registered and creating creating a viable alternative for both consumers and the auto rickshaw drivers and all the entire payment entire tra- entire revenue goes directly to the driver and, i mean there's no middleman to take that commission so this kind of a decentralized story can happen and mobility seems to be a very clear place and there's a conversation that is not just relevant for india we are seeing similar conversations on the mobility side across the world and so it's kind of very exciting how uh, this is showing some signs of early a uh, story of uh, success uh, although the scales are pretty limited right now but it does have signs of a winning implementation either as a platform by itself or as a as a bunch of you know experiences for the existing platforms to subscribe to and th- and and this example being that today if you let's say you, you need a ride to go to an airport uh, all the way and you have a long ride ahead of you you've you've done your taxi booking for that but what if you f- you want to have coffee on the way you feeling past and you want to have coffee on the way without having to order first or go to the airport and then have a coffee you can if the app is intuitive enough figure out that hey, this is a good 2 hour 1 hour journey ahead of you especially if you are in bangalore uh, heading to airport and that same app can intuitively ask you i can help you deliver coffee on the way and actually place an order on any of the coffee outlets along the path have some logistic player have it picked up and the delivery address for that coffee is actually a moving taxi of another platform another seller platform and have it delivered on the way now ability for the buyer app to not look at each transaction as a wholesome experience by itself but to combine different transactions at a protocol layer and stitch together an experience which is combinatorial okay i can have a teleconsultation or a physical consultation appointment booked and not worry about whether i can get my parking done for my car at the hospital but arrange for a taxi all done in one sort of one consumer journey experience and and reduce the cognitive load on the user if i'm going for a doctor consultation the prescription that comes out can automatically go to the pharmacy and have place an order or the 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 sample collection can come home and take a blood sample or have my food arranged while i'm back from the hospital think of a wider spectrum of experience and reducing friction friction for the user right so that's the possibility that an interoperable infrastructure like ondc will suddenly throw because you have diverse catalogs how do you stitch it together is the next opportunity out there for a buyer app and some of the big apps probably may not do it but that's an opportunity for for some of the younger startups to throw to show up or offer, offer that as a layer of service as a technology provider to some of the big apps so that that's the fascinating side of the buyer app which i'm very excited about uh, uh, actually sujit this is fascinating because whenever we think of ondc we think of friction increasing actually for the consumer or the customer uh, because you know you have suddenly disaggregated or unbundled the entire value chain of commerce so you actually think that the friction has increased but you bring a fantastic point which is you know uh, we don't realize the amount of friction we do because we do it over five apps but if i am able to combine everything into one app it actually reduces the friction for me as a buyer uh, that's that's really really interesting very interesting um i think we should switch gears and talk about um governance right what what do you think soshmit is that something that uh, you know what have we seen as a as a big question or a challenge in that with with these kinds of new models uh, so governance is is really one of those i would still say evolving part of ondc uh, part of the protocol and you know i would love to just to come in here and share his thoughts on how can one build in governance because it looks extreme i mean as it is ondc as a protocol is in a way in the cloud uh and you know governance sits on top of that so would love uh, for sujit to kind of make it a little more relatable for all of us sure um, i think yeah i think the fact that today your on ondc a single shopping experience kind of hops across multiple platform businesses who are probably solving one side of the puzzle the fact that it gets broken down across multiple platforms it kind of leads to a whole lot of series of questions uh, including the complexities that you know just what you're talking about 
now how do we solve for that if the if no one party is responsible for no one platform is responsible for the entire transaction i think that's where this question of governance becomes extremely important and essential because we don't want the end buyer or the end seller uh to not sort of get or deliver what they have promised and to do that it's one thing to say that yeah i can facilitate that transaction and interaction over a protocol across multiple platforms but how do we ensure the reliability integrity of the transaction so there are a whole lot of other sort of building blocks that has to come now in this whole new paradigm of a decentralized ecosystem so couple of things that probably was was a given in kind of a monolithic platform for example when i am placing an order on let's say a particular seller on a, on any popular marketplace um the seller probably has some credentials that i can verify and check like a reputation rating and things like that and therefore i know that between the two sellers for the same product i can choose x and not y because there's something else to give me some signal of trust or some signal of reliability or something that then you know, the job will be done well now how do we solve for uh, for a buyer who is on a platform a and the sellers are on different platforms and i pretty much i'm, I'm not talking neither me nor the platform is actually onboarded that seller uh, or or knows that seller uh, beforehand now that's an area where things like a decentralized ondc scoring or a reputation system is being put together which essentially re- recognizes the decentralized nature of the interaction that is happening and yet offer a way for the seller to 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 provide its rating and reputation which could be native to a platform on which the seller has been operating for example if i'm a driver on a one particular platform that platform has my rating and the travel history or if i'm a seller on a particular grocery aggregator platform it has my rating one is how do i make that rating which is native to my seller platform be available on the consumer side so that i think protocol today naturally enables that making it easier for customer to to choose between two equals if i were to say on everything else uh what ondc is doing further which is probably unprecedented and i think little gets spoken about today is that ondc is creating a platform agnostic reputation or a scoring system wherein even if the seller is hopping from one platform to the other uh, on the seller side it can continue to grow and accumulate its rating and score uh which is platform agnostic and interoperable so you can continue to build business so for example if i don't like staying on a one particular platform because of its policies or change in policies on pricing commission etc i can continue to do my business elsewhere and the same rating will be available in a very interoperable way so that's one element of governance that we solve for which is essentially important because ultimately ondc has to effuse trust to the actual uh, stakeholders which are the buyers and sellers and this is one of the ways the other thing and i can see that on your chart is this fact that what happens if the del the fulfillment is broken or the promise is not met if i say that i am shipping uh, a laptop in in four in in four days and if the what if that and i paid for the service as a consumer what if the laptop doesn't show up or something else shows up in place of the laptop and and the seller says okay the order is complete and how do you where do you where do you go and and raise your grievance or dispute so the buyer platform says that i don't control the seller when the seller is on another platform so given given that is also kind of an issue that we must solve if you are to look at a population sale commerce the other building block just like reputation is to create this whole decentralized online dispute resolution system where again it's an opportunity for some of these legal tech companies who have been in the business of odias to participate and and offer their services for both seller and platforms to sort of take this sort of broken transactions or disputes and 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 find a way to have some kind of a dispute resolution mechanisms going as if uh, the entire transaction was on the same platform so that's another opportunity and space where while it's unbundled you can still find a way to resolve and 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 bunch of things that the protocol is already enabling is that every transaction on ondc is a contractual promise it's a dual digitally signed my transaction contract that the buyer and seller platform plays which is you're not just placing the order on quantity and price or whatever goods and services but also the terms that you have mutually agreed before placing the order so the terms are baked into the contract in the transaction and therefore when you go for a dispute if you were to go for a dispute stage later on there are terms that you have signed up as both parties and those are the terms by which you have verified whether the service has been delivered 
or if if the buyer is making a fake complaint so those are the some of the other building blocks from a governance point of view that are coming uh, i mean this could also be the, the whole dispute resolution and uh, indice repetition as further enabled through a publicly auditable blockchain as an underlying infrastructure that's a design choice or indice is evaluating so whole lot of uh, such things are coming in to kind of bolster the trust on an otherwise decentralized ecosystem because that's a constant question and concern people say that i don't have one guy to hold on for my transaction there are so many guys i have to talk to uh, how are you making it easy for me and this is some of the building blocks that sort of solves for these elements of governance shushmit i i hope this was the larger question you wanted to you know where you you were looking at when you asked about governance yeah. a question i'm going to ask you one uh, a crazy question which is which is the craziest Sure. literally which is the which is the craziest idea that you have seen uh, on ondc so far or someone talked to you even about uh, building in ondc which has been the craziest so far i don't know if it's a if it's yet on ondc but i think uh, it will be soon but i think one of the craziest bets and i see an entrepreneur taking is that everybody is trying to move merchants to cloud like a kirana store or a local salon or whatever Uh, here's a guy who's trying to move cloud into the Kirana stores. So with ONDC, this entrepreneur is putting together a Raspberry Pi based product, which is essentially a basic, essential, lightweight compute to to digitize the catalog of a local Kirana store. Put that Raspberry Pi server in the Kirana store, uh, and and integrate that with backend protocol and ONDC specifications, so that cust- so that the Kirana store can directly project its catalog onto ONDC. from its store from that server in the store without having to be you know available on some third party cloud and that ability and it gives full freedom and control so whenever the shutter of the shop is over or is closed maybe the raspberry pi is switching off is not available for uh, for any kind of a order taking when the shutter is open you can switch off you can control the terms control the catalog uh, you can probably put the top 5 selling items or 20 items pretty much from the from a bluetooth enabled phone uh, talking to the raspberry pi server the fact that you can move the entire commerce capability to the edges to the to the exactly the point where the actual seller is without having to onboard a bunch of sellers onto a big platform and manage the whole thing online that kind of a local decentralization and moving power to the ends was i think was a was a fascinating crazy idea that i found i wish uh, those ideas take off and achieve scale uh, but yeah i thought that was very interesting yeah wow i think this is something that uh... you know all of us uh, dream of which is i mean this is the ultimate uh, point of technology right which is you enable uh, you know what they call the antyodhya or the last person in the uh, in, in, in the economic chain and not the median person alone the, lastly uh, so just want to understand from you i mean i'm just trying to think bigger which is you know if if let's say country x apart from india also adopts uh, ondc then why can't cross border commerce also be governed by ondc i mean is that something that beckin as a foundation is trying to evangelize or you think this is because if the governance layer itself can be abstracted away and they can take care of beauty customs etc then you think that you know if two countries are ready to come on uh, ondc and then this can actually be abstracted all the way up to international commerce yeah i think the that's the i think that's i think the the real power of interoperability is i mean the fact that internet is borderless because it's interoperable your whole mobile phone gsm technology is largely interoperable and you can make international calls and you know from any operator to any operator i don't see a reason why a protocol like backend uh, can allow for a cross border commerce i think one of the things that we wanted to uh, be careful with the design is to make make the protocol as generic and as configurable as possible whether you want to configurable make it configurable by a certain so- sovereign uh, borders or you can keep it open across multiple sovereign borders those are all a matter of configuration on the protocol so if there is an ondc network here and let's say there's another ondc or maybe let's say the whole of euro has another similar commerce network the fact that they have the underlying same interoperable language or the glue you can enable you can overlay policies for import export you can enable policies for domestic trade international trade these are all configurable features on an interoperable protocol so clearly that's possible uh, and and back in that way is is as a globally open source protocol so i already see a few other countries kind of looking at in the way that they they want to customize it use it for a very specific purpose some of them may be looking at mobility some of them may be looking at commerce and others but 
there's no reason why they can't they can't talk to each other and have cross border trade available yeah i mean when i say talk to each other like a network there and an ondc network here talk to each other and facilitate uh, yeah inter border transactions uh, cross border transactions yeah great uh, i think nitin started uh, this episode with uh, this being a uh, superpower or the soft power for india and hopefully sujit uh, you and uh, dr pramod and mr nandan and the whole team at ondc and beckin can actually make this uh, protocol a global protocol uh, from india uh, thank you so much uh, for all that you have done for us and for taking time out today uh, thank you so much sujit thank you thank you so yeah. much thank you i just want to say that and it takes everybody's effort uh, then the protocol is only as good as the network that is adopting it so it takes everybody's <laughs> effort and there's so much of innovation that can happen on it and it takes every entrepreneur to to stretch their muscle thinking muscle innovation muscle and push it and that's going to be the the story from india that i'm looking forward to I'm looking forward to it yeah thank you so much for this great session we learned so much the possibilities are truly endless thanks to dr pramod and mr nandan for leading this charge at beckett we would be amiss if we don't thank mr koshi and mr vibhor from ondc for all the effort that they're taking to further this cause at antler we are extremely excited about the innumerable opportunities to build for india from india looking forward to helping founders build maybe over 100 unicorns in dpis in india if anyone is building on ondc as a protocol or even beckin do reach out to us at antler india feel free to even email me at sushmit.patodia@antler.co that's all from this episode from theory of next on dpis and ondc thank you again for listening in have a great day